I'll go ahead and get started before I introduce this uh, wonderful panel. And, and, and I thought I'd use this as kind of a scene setter to take five minutes to kind of talk about a veteran. And, and I apologize if I'm talking down to anyone here, but I think there's a tendency to think this is a much simpler issue than it really is when you talk about military mental health. That all veterans are those of us who served and are serving. When in reality, there's all different colors and all different flavors. And, and let me start. Let, let, let me start by telling you what the problem is. When you look in the, at the, what we call the invisible wounds of war, which are really very, very visible, you're talking about about 400,000 diagnosis of traumatic brain injury. And I'm sorry for those of you who are here um, only to hear about mental health, and I know I'm talking about something that is not considered by you to be a mental health issue, and I mentioned traumatic brain injury. But I can't separate TBI from post-traumatic stress because we see such a high com comorbidity, anywhere from 60 to 80% in service members, they have both. Um, but we've had approximately 400,000 diagnoses of traumatic brain injury since September 11th, 2001. I've heard numbers that say that about 80% of them were in training with 20% of them in combat. We have deployed close to, close to 3 million soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines since 9-1-1 to the Mideast and Afghanistan. Uh, and of those, the estimates are anywhere from between 10 and 20% have post-traumatic stress. I will not use the D, okay? I know that you call it you use the D, I don't use the D. I, I just think it's wrong to sell, tell someone they have a disorder when um, they have a rough time after getting uh, a traumatic brain injury in an explosion and spending the next four hours picking up the body pieces of the person that was in, in the front vehicle uh, who was blown up. Just like I think it's wrong to say someone has a disorder if a woman is violently sexually assaulted. It just makes no sense to me, and I think words matter. So I have dropped the D and only used post-traumatic stress. Um, when I was in the service, I considered myself a veteran, but I really wasn't. I wasn't a veteran until I got out of the service. Um, the rules change when you get out of the service. In addition, we have National Guardsmen and reservists. Uh, and we have those in the Navy and the Air Force and in the Marines who serve for a period of time and then leave the service. They can be um, uh, mobilized, go in for a year to 18 months, come back out. It's important to understand that when they're in the service, um, DOD doctors take care of them. When they come out, they can go to the VA and get care from the VA. There are issues that, that we had then because um, they would go to the VA and get care, be put on particular drugs, but the VA, at least when I was vice, wouldn't share the medical information of the drugs they were put on when I re-mobilized them and brought them uh, back into the service. So, so we had issues there. Um, there's two different medical systems. There's the DOD medical system made up of military doctors. I had more doctors at the height of the war than I had infantrymen. Um, every time the VA got criticized for not being able to see someone with post-traumatic stress in, in enough time, uh, I would find that I would lose doctors. People like to live in places like Nashville a lot more than they like to live in places um, like Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Um, so that was always a problem for me. I hate it when the VA got criticized because I would lose uh, a lot of the um, uh, psychiatrists and psychologists that I had in the active component force. Uh, the VA is hamstrung in some areas in trying to care for uh, folks with post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury. By law, they cannot care for families. I think there are some exceptions, but I think most of you know that some of these extreme cases of traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress, a tremendous effect on the family, and family care is, is needed. Uh, and then veterans must qualify for the VA. Just because you've served, just because you've served in combat, does not necessarily mean that you are granted access to VA health care. It all depends on your characterization of service. And because, and I apologize to you professionals, 
Your diagnostics are so, so poor when it comes to trying to identify exactly what it is. I, you know, I, I, I know DSM-5 is what you have for post-traumatic stress, but I wish we could get past DSM-5 to some kind of a biological diagnostic. Because you can go online today, and, and service members do, and, and, and they can know how to answer the questions in order to get a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress. And in 2007, Congress made it mandatory that anyone who has a VA diagnosis of post-traumatic stress gets 50% disability for the rest of their life, which creates, in some instances, people who cheat. When they're asked to leave the service after five deployments, we decide to downsize. They didn't get their 20 years in. They don't have any opportunity to have any retirement. They go in for their final physical. Someone's told them, get a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress. There'll be more money in your check when you leave. And, and then it creates this problem that when they do go to the VA or they do go to you and get care, I always get a blank look when I look at a VA caregiver and I say, when you make them better, do you lower their disability? And they all basically look at me and say, no, and, and, and there's a reason for that. They would never get anybody back in any one of their clinics if, if they did that. And, and this culture of dependency, I, I think, is, is, is really a, a sad, sad thing that we, we as a nation have, have got to take a look at. But when it comes to veteran service organizations, there's no way after a war you're going to go in and start taking away um, from veterans that which they feel that they have earned in, in combat. And with that, I will stop and introduce our first panelist. The plan here is to go around, spend about five minutes. I may ask a few questions from each of them. Um, I'm going to provide a brief introduction. Uh, and then I, I think what would be most helpful is if we open up for your questions, because you always learn a lot more when you're listening than when you're talking. <laughs> So I will defer to a, a, a great friend of mine. I've not always been able to say that because I had to testify in front of him about 10 or 15 times and it was never fun. But somebody in retirement that I've worked very closely with who is a great friend, um, the Honorable Patrick Kennedy, and there is no greater friend to those of us who are trying to tackle these very, very difficult problems uh, than the Honorable Patrick Kennedy. Patrick. Thanks, General. Um, I am grateful for the opportunity to uh, sit beside some, uh, some of those great Americans who've actually worn the uniform of our country. I have to say one of the real benefits of having been in Congress was that I had a chance to get a bird's eye view, and that's all it was, General, a bird's eye view of what you all do for our country in uniform. I always if I were ever able to explain to my constituents uh, what our military does for them, um, they, they would be so immensely proud. Um, I was on the Armed Services Committee for six years before I was on the Appropriations Committee and traveled all over the world to uh, some dangerous places, so to speak, but uh, most of our veterans know what real danger is, especially like uh, uh, General Corelli having served <clears throat> in a place where you never knew where the enemy line was because it could be an IED anywhere you turned. So uh, the need for us to better understand brain illness and how to help address in a much more effective way brain illness and treat those who suffer from brain illness has been really made possible by the fact that our veterans have demanded a sense of urgency around these issues that we would not find otherwise. So everyone's bemoaning the plight of the opioid crisis. They're bemoaning the plight, as they should, of the suicide crisis. Um, I guarantee you our country would not be as focused on these issues if it weren't for the fact that our veterans is suffering disproportionately from both the opioid epidemic and the suicide crisis, which, by the way, in the suicide crisis, 
a large percentage of those suicides are driven by a substance use disorder. So um, really the fight for our nation's veteran is the fight for all Americans. Our veterans fought against terrorism overseas. They fought to keep the terrorists there as opposed to coming here. And in a real sense, when they came home, they're fighting for the rest of Americans who are held hostage by fear, panic, depression, and addiction. And literally, when we figure out how we're going to kick down the doors and save those veterans who really haven't come home from war, we're going to end up also learning how to save our fellow Americans who, because they saw violence in their home or they saw violence in their cities or they grew up in, in homes that were traumatized, we're going to be able to better address their needs too. So I really believe that this is a fight that isn't soldier or civilian. This is a fight that is both civilian and soldier working together, and we need to bring all of our resources together in order to, to address this. And as citizens, we have a huge stake in protecting our veteran, not only because it's the right thing to do, but if we are able to do a better job taking care of them, guess what? The rest of Americans will also uh, benefit, as has always been the case with our Department of Defense research and, and work. So um, honored to be here, uh, also happy to talk about some of these other issues with respect to guard and reservists as, as their issues are really, as the general mentioned, uh, affected by our health insurance system um, as much as by the adequacy of a VA system which has still not gotten its arms around quote unquote the invisible wounds of war which uh, the general spoke about. Um, that has meant that veterans have often found themselves really wanting in terms of access to needed services as civilian soldiers working for all of the leading companies in our country um, because their private employer insurance doesn't adequately cover uh, mental health and addiction issues. They're at a disadvantage uh, simply because their injuries of war are putting them at higher risk for needing help with depression, needing help with addiction and panic and anxiety and so forth. So uh, that's one more example of where we need to get the both the civilian and military sector to have greater uh, coordination. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, when I became vice in uh, 2008, vice chief of staff of the Army, um, our suicide rate had risen from 10 per 100,000 to 21 per 100,000 since September 11, 2001. That put us on par with a demographically um, corrected population um, that the CDC gave us with uh, civilian suicide. So we saw our suicide rate double uh, in about a seven-year period. So it's a, a great honor for me to have on this panel Dr. Marsden McGuire, who currently serves as the acting chief consultant in the Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention in, in the Department of Veterans Affairs. Sir. Thank you, General. Um, I, I trust everyone can hear me. I, I know you can see me from the lights. <laughs> uh, they're rather bright, but uh, I am honored to be here uh, representing VA and to be with such uh, esteemed colleagues and to be able to uh, engage in a conversation with you. Uh, you've heard a lot um, already about what the basic issues are, so I won't repeat any of those. I do want to make the point, though, that one of the issues for VA um, providing care to veterans is that uh, only about a third of veterans in this country are enrolled in VA health care. So um, we can do very good things, we believe, uh, for those who are enrolled in our care, and I'll give you some examples of that. But the real challenge is to be able to connect with veterans, not necessarily to bring them into v VA care. I mean, if we tripled our size and got everybody enrolled, we wouldn't be able to do anything efficiently. 
Uh, what we need to do under the guidance of uh, Secretary Shulkin is really reach out, and it was started by his predecessor, Secretary McDonald, uh, in, in terms of partnerships, uh, which we have in certain limited ways already, uh, but not that are focused on direct care to the veteran. So we have academic medical center affiliations where we do wonderful research, but we don't even know how to characterize the veterans that are out there not in our care which we need to do in order to be able to offer services that are effective. So um, I have one slide, that's it. Um, one example is, and this is going you know, on the prevention line, this is primary prevention. Self-care apps on a smartphone. All of you are able, by going to an app store, to download PTSD Coach, which is usable by anybody who has or thinks they have PTSD to uh, find out more about their symptoms, to be able to track them over time, locate local resources, and um, find help when it's needed. Now, what it doesn't do is connect through the firewall to the medical record that they may have if they're enrolled in VA uh, to the electronic health record. Um, and that's for a couple of good reasons. There's privacy and security. Uh, there's also that many veterans don't want to have that information going, uh, although if there was a way we could offer it as an option, it would be very useful, and people are working on that. Uh, there are other uh, types of apps, for instance, uh, family apps, so there's a PTSD family application, there are provider apps, there are treatment ac accompanying apps, so that if you have another diagnosis, you can use the app as sort of a supplementary form of uh, therapy. You can use it to engage in cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, uh, as an example. Um, a second area, predictive analytics. This is big data to make predictions about individuals who are at the highest risk for whatever outcome you're thinking of, and that could be suicide. And in fact, we have a program called ReachVet. I won't tell you what the acronym is. It's, you'll never remember it. But it's reaching out to vets through this big data program, which identifies those specific individuals so that those involved in their care uh, within VA can be alerted to those people needing an enhanced level of care which they may or may not already be receiving. Um, the challenge there, of course, is how you broach the subject and communicate with a veteran who may not even, A, be receiving health, mental health services, and B, uh, may not have any symptoms of um, suicide or depression or suicidal ideation. So we have a, a whole rollout to try and uh, communicate with veterans more effectively. Just to quickly run through uh, emerging therapies, so the first two things I've talked about are ways to prevent illnesses from occurring through self-care and predictive analytics. Now, if you've got a diagnosis, let's say, of PTSD or depression, there are many new uh, therapies, one uh, being repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. This is a, a treatment that is uh, fairly uh, benign in terms of side effects, but oh, uh, it's FDA approved for depression, and many people think it may be effective for PTSD. We're currently looking at that in a collaborative study which is focused on people with both depression and PTSD. The general will like to know that we also have emerging uh, therapy or diagnostics, strictly speaking, that will lead the therapeutics with our PTSD brain bank, which has just been rolled up and is actually a line item in, uh, in the uh, congressional uh, budget that VA gets every year, and that bank is already started publications on potential biomarkers for PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, on the issue of telemental health, what a wonderful flexible tool to be able to reach out and we have stood up a hub and spoke model in the last year and a half and we have 11 identified hubs which are running to almost 200 different spokes throughout the country. 
that's built on top of this sort of uh, will tele-mental health that we had at a local basis, but without any national coordination. The challenges there are legislative. We can't do certain things across state lines. We're trying to correct that. There's also, if you think of the demographic of the veteran population, you have a younger population much more comfortable with tele-services than uh, Vietnam-era veterans, although we're getting better at that. Um, Data-driven initiatives. Um, what I mean by that is uh, we have the ability to use, again, big data to identify people, individual prescribers, or clinics, or facilities that are appropriately prescribing for certain conditions or inappropriately prescribing. And by looking at the inappropriate prescribing, the outliers under or over what they should be, for instance, how many people uh, pay, uh, veterans are on benzodiazepines and opioids, a big no-no. Well, you can just pull that data up. And then through the process of academic detailing, where trained pharmacists uh, work with the provider to educate them, and then we can follow the results of that. And we've got a huge decrease in inappropriate prescribing as a result of this program. And it's, it's wonderful. And then the last is that we're undergoing modernization, like all of the government, and in VA that really means focusing on our core function, which as you've heard is suicide prevention, and part of that is um, appropriate targeting of every means possible uh, to, uh, to treat and prevent PTSD, chronic pain, insomnia, substance use disorders, and depression, which are all thought to feed into um, the, the bad outcome of suicide. I will stop there for any questions or comments. No, thank you very much. Very, very informative. Thank you. Uh, in 2009, uh, Arnold Fisher opened uh, a center called the Center for the Intrepid uh, in San Antonio for the rehabilitation of service members who lost arms, legs, and multiple limbs. And what he soon came to realize was that those safe service members the blast that tore off a limb or a number of limbs on that individual also shook up his brain. And he decided to stand up at Walter Reed uh, out of Bethesda. Um, for those of you in the Navy, I know that's hard to hear me say. <laughs> um, something called the National uh, Intrepid Center of Excellence for the Treatment of Traumatic Brain Injury and Post-Traumatic Stress. Um, it took a private entrepreneur to do something like that. Uh, it is an amazing place, and if you ever get out there, um, uh, I think you'll be impressed with the care that is offered. Uh, I first met um, Bob Kaufman uh, at the NICO. Um, he was uh, a doctor there. He is a retired Navy uh, captain. He's a medical director for the Semper Fi Fund, or America's Fund, and the senior medical advisor for the Warrior Canine Connection. Bob. Thank you, sir. Well, good afternoon. It's an honor to be uh, sharing the stage with such leaders and, and uh, uh, warriors and lawmakers. It, it truly is. Um, I'm, I'm going to try and, and be worthy of, of, of characterizing what the military has done to take care of these hidden wounds of war. Uh, as the general was saying, I was the uh, I was fortunate to be the, uh, the the inaugural chief of clinical operations at the National Intrepid Center of Excellence, from which I retired recently. Um, however, still work as a Red Cross volunteer, providing service along with my trusty um, aide, who is my uh, voice-activated, auto-retrieving uh, oxytocin dispenser uh, <laughs> co-therapist, Ron. He's, uh, he's not impressed. Uh, anyway, I, uh, I have a few slides. My charge today is really to tell you about the, the Fitness Center, which is one of the NICO's National Intrepid Center of Excellence's um, uh, latest efforts to uh, bring cognitive remediation and rehab into the world of uh, the, the brain injured. But begin, let me begin by uh, just uh, telling you a little bit about the NICO and uh, our model of care, which I think is really 
instructive for this entire um, two days in terms of what is possible when it comes to uh, treatment of, of the hidden wounds of war, particularly in the military population, which, as you'll see, is a very different population than the civilian population. But the NICO is, is, is appropriately nestled um, on the academic campus between uh, the University uh, Ushu's uh, Medical School as well as NIH and um, there's there's a lot of collaboration and partnership finally wh which uh, is something that we could spend another whole hour talking about but at its core the National Intrepid Center of Excellence was built to take care of the sickest of the sick the most chronically ill comorbid individuals suffering from PTS slash D and uh, the, and TBI. And, and as you know, uh, as you've heard, the comorbidity of, of those conditions, particularly with substance abuse, chronic pain, and polypharmacy are legion. And they really required a, a, a special effort that um, Mr. Arnold Fisher stepped up to the plate to deliver. But you can see that um, uh, the TBI casualty spiked in around 2008. And of those casualties, um, the, fortunately, the majority are mild. Do know, and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but that is, there's no, great mis, there's no greater misnomer than mild. These individuals are suffering, to be sure, and, and the, the characterization of mild is really based on length of time of alteration or loss of consciousness, not a pathophysiologic state, not a, not a condition of end organ, not a condition of, of functional impairment. And so, um, that's just as the general uh, really wants to make a point that uh, uh, that the PTSD is not a disorder. Uh, mild TBI is not a mild condition. Um, military TBI, which is really one of the cornerstone for the National Intrepid Center of Excellence, which, by the way, I, I failed to uh, I, I failed to acknowledge that Mr. Fisher, undaunted, has gone ahead to raise money, um, and our center was $65 million, but Mr. Fisher has gone through the Intrepid Fallen Heroes Fund to raise money for nine more centers throughout the DOD to try and move the needle and really change the way that brain injury is being addressed. But the bottom line with military TBI is where civilian TBI typically uh, is uh, either sports or accident related, Military TBI tends to be much more chronic, and by much more chronic, I say that upwards of 50% of individuals, as the general was saying, will develop chronicity. And again, it's, it's largely, uh, in part, it's because of the comorbidity, but it's also, we're now realizing that blast TBI is very different from concussive force TBI. And, and those individuals require an, an entirely different approach. And that approach is really kind of what defines the, the model of care at the National Intrepid Center of Excellence, that, that understanding that, that blast injuries are very different. The, the thing that makes the NICO um, exceptional is, is really is, is not the practices. As you can see, we have all of the same providers that uh, other, other facilities have. But what we do in four weeks is we stack and, 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 and uh, provide over 104 hours of care in four weeks that would otherwise take six months or longer. And we found that that's really, that, that's a very uh, effective way, especially when, when orchestrated in an interdisciplinary fashion, to really get to the, the uh, hidden wounds of war, both psychologically and, and neurologic. And, and a word about how we, what we do. It, we've, we've heard today that, you know, diagnoses are, uh, we, we need to look at diagnoses as dimensional or functional alterations. The commonality of every patient who, is, who, who comes to the National Intrepid Center of Excellence is suffering. And that's the diagnosis that, that I treat is suffering. And, and it's really kind of, it's very reductionistic, as the general was saying, to try and chase specific diagnoses. There's time for that. But the, these individuals who come to the NICO have already seen dozens of other providers. They have failed all treatments, and they have not gotten better. And they are miserable, and they are suffering. And they're not just suffering from the hidden wounds of war, but this, this, this complex constellation. 
And, and so it, it's important, as you can see from the sequence goals, is the first and foremost is to develop a trusting therapeutic relationship with the individual. By the time these service members come to us, they are incredibly cynical about the care that they've received because largely they've received uh, medical care, which is pretty much a standard throughout the United States, evidence-based treatment with, with the prescribed uh, interventions. The problem is, is that no Nobody has really had the luxury of time to really get to know these individuals and to work with them. And, and so NICO really has been a, a real game changer in terms of developing this trusting relationship and, and as you can see in the goal sets, really peel back these moral injuries which after 16 years of war, everybody who has deployed has moral injuries. And that's, that's a concept in and of itself that, that um, we, we can talk about. But NICO, I, I just want to share a couple of pictures. There's um, everything from um, uh, uh, neuroimaging, magnetoencephalography, CT, 3T, uh, uh, MRI, the um, uh, rock wall climbing, as well as the, uh, the, even, the, even the architecture is designed to be healing. In fact, it was designed as a healing space with not a lot of angles. Everything is curved with, uh, with natural woods and calming, uh, calming light and environment, which, as you know, people with TBI suffer significant photophobia. So the entire building, to include the Central Park, an uh, uh, homage to Mr. Fisher, where uh, mindfulness meditation and a walking labyrinth prevail and, and uh, aqua therapy. But stacking all of these interventions uh, to include um, the importance of, of uh, the expressive arts, um, uh, both art and music therapy, is really, um, you know, as characterized by uh, now integrative medicine, really provides a, a different language of communicating um, suffering. Um, a couple more uh, slides. Just, just know that um, even though we don't provide specific evidence-based treatment, um, <clears throat> virtually 70 to 80 percent of individuals, uh, whether it's headache, whether it's sleep, whether it's PCL, get better. And they do so, um, like I say, without specific evidence-based treatments. And, and why is that? It's, it's because of the approach. It's not necessarily what is done, but it's how it's done. So the Brain Fitness Center was, was stood up in 2008, and that was really a, a, a result of uh, the fact that we had uh, hundreds of service members who had, who had been medevac back and were still in various stages of rehab. And so it, in part, it was an, it was a it was an understanding that we had uh, to do something in terms of cognitive remediation, but uh, there was also an, there was also a, 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 a research imperative to stand up the Brain Fitness Center, and in fact, the Brain Fitness Center has grown to the point now that it has um, it's pretty much uh, a full house any time that. Uh, that uh, you would come to visit. The average number of appointments, as you can see, uh, uh, 45 days. But with, with uh, the, the nice thing about the Brain Fitness Center is that, again, that, that same sort of relationship is developed amongst the providers and the, uh, and the patients. And the patient actually chooses which um, cognitive remediation, which app they're going to use. Uh, I'll end with the idea that um, a heart rate variability and uh, the use of um, uh, biofeedback uh, should be central to everyone's practice. We don't talk enough about autonomic disruption and as the core of, of, uh, of suffering, but it, it truly is um, perhaps the most important skill set that we can teach. I have a short uh, two, two minute video on the uh, center. Can we roll that? So the Brain Fitness Center is, I think, represents a, a very exciting uh, emerging area in rehabilitation. He has, he's had a lot of rehabilitation services here. The area that we're particularly interested in is traumatic brain injury. So about nine months after the We started off with just two programs and have expanded to seven programs. Now, although we were originally designed for the active duty service members coming back from the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, we realized pretty quickly that there were many more individuals out there that needed something like this. And we've had over 450 patients now use the Brain Fitness Center. I 
I remember waking up in a construction ditch and I don't remember the original accident, but I remember having to crawl out of it in order to get help. I think I crawled about 50 feet or so and finally I came across somebody and they called an ambulance for me. I've been going to the Brain Fitness Center for about two months. It helps me to work on my memory and there's a lot of different aspects to it. There's calculation, there's long-term memory, short-term memory, and many other things that you can do to improve your cognitive function. It's helped me really to remember faces, names, everything, even like my reading and my math has gotten a lot better. My unit was mobilized and deployed to Jordan uh, on a mission. And while I was in Jordan, uh, I was uh, struck by a vehicle. I got involved in the Brain Fitness Center at the suggestion of my nurse case manager here at Walker Reed. It's really strange when you know, you're 40 years old and you're used to being able to recall facts and do calculations and so forth, uh, and then all of a sudden, one little piece of that ability has somehow disappeared, you know, or, or it's hidden for a while. And then over the course of several weeks of doing the program, suddenly, and I mean really mean suddenly, like from one session to the next, I came in and it seemed so much more easy to find those differences. You're sharp today. You got it on the first try. So along with the clinical care we're providing, we've been doing some, some scientific investigations around this. So we have, uh, we have protocols that we've been doing to randomize clinical trials to look at what works best for whom when. Anecdotally, we hear so many stories about what these programs are doing for them and their lives. And we've heard everything from this has saved my marriage to <laughs> I can finally go to the grocery store and remember things. And, and whether it's truly based on, on this program or just their overall um, empowerment of doing something for themselves and feeling good, we are seeing that it, it's working for our patients. Thanks, Bob. For those of you who have not been around neuroscientists, you will find that anybody who has any training whatsoever is always surprised when they put 40 slides into a 10 minute slot and they can't get through them. And it's always <laughs> surprised me that it, 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 their amazement at not being able to do that. Before we open it up for questions, hey Pat Patrick, you have been a leader in the whole parody movement. And I would like to ask you to Maybe give us a few comments on, on veterans health care and parity. Sure. So uh, signature wound of the war uh, are these traumatic brain injuries and post-traumatic stress. Um, our medical system has always segregated things of the brain, mental health, as something separate and unequal from the rest of the medical system. The insurance system doesn't pay for it in the same way they would other medical, physical, surgical costs. And then we all wonder why we've got such a public health crisis on our hands. As it relates to parity, there is a law that requires insurers to pay for brain health in the same way they would pay for any other physical, surgical health. And and it's across six buckets, inpatient, in-network, outpatient, in-network, inpatient, out-of-network, outpatient, out-of-network, pharmacy, and ER. I mention that to prove the point that we need to be systemically attacking discrimination, because that's what this is. Payers have gotten away discriminating against people with these illnesses because we often haven't understood how to treat them. And so it's led to a cycle where these illnesses become 
pushed aside, not considered real medicine. Now, of course, we're making great inroads in how to better treat uh, brain illnesses, and we ought, to need, we ought to be about enforcing the parity law. Now, parity is not only specific to insurance, but it's more broadly a spirit. And the spirit is, are we going to treat these uh, illnesses in the same way we would any other illnesses? And as uh, those who, like General Corelli, have been trying to address uh, suicide and the other um, symptoms of untreated TBI and post-traumatic stress will tell you there's anything but the same sense of urgency towards these challenges like there would be if these were other uh, physical challenges. But as General Corelli will also tell you, these signature war, wounds of war are our greatest challenge. Um, they say every war, the, the VA, the military, has an aha moment on what they need to address in, in terms of their health care. Clearly, uh, brain health issues are the issues of this uh, recent war. And so uh, that is a good news. Now we got to get the private payers, as well as the government, to start reimbursing for therapies in the same way. Now, a lot of folks will say, oh, well, it is not as far along as cancer. Well, can you remember how many years it took us paying for cancer before we ever got better uh, mortality rates? Three decades, friends. Three decades paying full freight for cancer. And thank God we did. Every member of my family's had cancer. But the bottom line is why we're putting this onus, well, mental health has to show immediate results for us to be able to pay for it. That's a double standard, my friends, a double standard. I'll end with that, too. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, questions? in the few minutes we have left. Sir. Uh, my name is Leo Doran. I'm a reporter. Um, uh, one of the most striking uh, statistics um, that came out of there um, that frankly surprised me was that 80% of these injuries happen in non-combat situations in training. Um, and so what I'd like to know is, I guess, what's going on in training uh, that's leading to so many of these injuries, um, and are there any changes uh, that we should be looking at um, to, to lower the number of TBIs uh, that happen in training? Yeah, I'd, I'd be careful in those numbers. I mean, that was the Surgeon General's number. 80% of the, of the diagnosed post-traumatic uh, traumatic brain injuries we had were, did occur in training, but military training is it can, can, can be pretty tough, but the, but the issue is there's 400,000 uh, service members that have a diagnosis of traumatic brain injury since 2001. There's 2.8 million Americans that have a traumatic brain injury every um, single year. Um, you know, that's why when I go around my house, I can't find a ladder anymore. Um, my, my wife took them all away. And, you know, <laughs> we see the highest instances of TBI occurring in um, uh, increases in TBI as, as cardiologists get better at prolonging life and we get further along with cancer, we see in older Americans uh, and citizens of the world uh, a higher incidence of TBI. So, so I'd be careful at looking at that number and thinking the, the military is not doing what it can to try to limit traumatic brain injury in training, um, but uh, quite frankly, the military can be a contact sport and it, you're, you're going to see some concussions occur when you're jumping out of perfectly good aircraft with a parachute. So I, I'd be careful. I'd be more than happy to talk more about that. Anybody else? Ma'am. Um, Captain Kaufman, I would like you to talk a little bit about um, the NICO re-entry back into um, once they've been at your clinic and have been there as long as they have. How about re-entry back into their home community? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, did you understand? NICO re-entry? After, after they've been to the Center for Excellence, they go back to their home communities. How is that handoff for them to go back
Uh, especially people in rural areas. The problem is, is that they go back to sort of the same system that oftentimes wasn't able to fix them. There's a very detailed uh, disposition plan when they leave. They leave with a care plan, and I've seen people leave a government facility, which is the NICO, go back to their base with a, with, with a care plan. Let's say it's the United States Military Academy. Not a lot of TBI at the United States Military Academy. They go into the TRICARE system, and TRICARE refuses to pay for 50% of their treatment plan. Right. I mean, that, that, that's just ridiculous. You know, their own government insurance won't cover down on that. Hmm. And I'm getting the done. And, and that's an important thing to be done because I'm the only thing standing between you and a 15 minute break. I wanna thank you very much. I wanna thank our panelists um, and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs>